let's start with das Topspiel. Um, there's been some really interesting mixed reactions from that match. Um, I think the bottom line here is that Leverkusen will be quite happy with this point. It's the same point that they got last year from the Allianz Arena, right? A little bit different this time around. I, I thought that they had to work a lot harder for it. Um, and I, I also think that if you buy a Munich, you'll probably be pretty unhappy about just the one point. And if you're a fan of all the other top four or six, top six uh, teams in the Bundesliga, you're probably happy that both teams dropped two points because it really kind of shoves the table back together, right? The top four all separated by just three points now. It's it, it's an interesting game, and I think there's so many different takeaways for either one of these sides. And so um, what were your first thoughts coming out of this match? Yeah, it was quite a conflicting game to really kind of draw any huge, you know, con huge kind of or lasting kind of impressions from or kind of hot takes mm. or anything because it was a draw. At the end of the day, you know, both teams are forced to kind of settle for a point and the very nature of a draw means that it's compromised and no one's really particularly happy mm. with the way that things went. Um, I'm kind of on the, on the, kind of coming around to the idea that actually it was a good, it was a, it was a game that both teams actually did quite well in. Um mm. In, diff in different ways and I'll try and explain that and then people can tell me if I'm talking nonsense but um, on the one hand the most obvious one was of course the way that Bayer Leverkusen played a very defensive very limited performance um, against Bayern Munich they sat extremely deep um, they really struggled to pass the ball around the pitch uh, I just saw Opta suggesting that uh, for the first time in 98 games uh, Bayern limited them to just three shots uh, in, a, in a match mm. um, and you know someone in our uh, one of our subscribers in the subscriber chat said it felt like Bayern against a bottom half table side and yeah. you know I'm inclined to agree with that from what we saw in this game um, so you know on the one hand you can definitely say that yeah Leverkusen were played within themselves they didn't look like title contenders mm. they didn't look like a team who wanted to go toe to toe with Bayern Munich um, they certainly didn't look like a team who wants to come to the Allianz Arena and try and pick up all three points. Um, and I think all that's true. Um, but I think the context which we have to maybe consider this game in is that, you know, Leverkusen went into it with a very wobbly uh, run of form. Uh, we mm -hmm. obviously saw them kind of go into that Leipzig game, try, game, try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe -toe with them, and they kind of got pulled apart. Uh, we've seen... Far lesser sides cause them all sorts of problems this season defensively. Wolfsburg, the most obvious one last weekend, uh, yeah. where they almost kind of stole a win over, over them twice in that game before a rather fortunate red card uh, to a Wolfsburg player kind of turned the game in, in Leverkusen's favour and they went on to win it. So I can understand if Xabi Alonso went into this game thinking, um, you know, my team are struggling defensively. Uh, they're giving away silly goals. They're they're they're, mm. they're letting teams create a lot of chances against us. And if I basically go out there and try to outscore Bayern Munich in this game, there's a good chance that Bayern would just simply thrash us because defensively yeah. we're just all over the place. Um, and I think what he decided to do in this game, and and look, it's it it comes down to interpretation. Some people can say that Bayern forced to support Leverkusen, and I understand that, and it's something I would also partly agree with. I think it's I think both things can be true. I think. I think I think Xavi Alonso went into this game and his clear intention was to make sure his team put on a strong defensive performance. Mm. And I think that's really important for Leverkusen because, you know, people think of Leverkusen as this team who score late goals, who have Florian Farts, they've got Victor Boniface, they've got Frimpong, they've got these such exciting attacking players. But at the core of Leverkusen's success last season was um, discipline. You know, mm. this team was disciplined tactically, disciplined in a system, and they were disciplined in the way that they dominated teams and won games. And this is the first time I would say that I've actually seen Leverkusen be that old disciplined side this season, which I know it seems like an odd thing to say because they didn't play well against Bayern. But from a defensive point of view, I thought they were very disciplined. And it's the first time mm. I've seen them look defensively solid this season. Um, and at the end of the day, it won them a point against the, what I thought was a really impressive Bayern Munich team. Yep. You know, I thought, um, you know, We've talked about this uh, going into this game that Bayern look like the Harlem Globetrotters against admittedly much lesser sides uh, in Germany and in European competition. 
Um, and I did wonder how that would translate to a team again, a, a team of Leverkusen's quality, but they more or less took the same sort of strands of those performances into this match and did the exact same thing against Leverkusen. They dominated the game, they dominated the chances. Mm. I thought their passing was exceptional, and I thought their off the ball tenacity to win the ball back was exceptional. Yeah. And that's probably the first time I've seen Bayern played like that in quite some time. And so so that's why I kind of come to this conclusion that I thought Leverkusen's performance was really strong from a certain point of view, and Xabi Alonso can be happy with that. And why I also think Vincent Company and Bayern fans should be encouraged by their performance because maybe this is a kind of, maybe this is a, a cheeky thing to say, but it looked like Pep Guardiola's Bayern. Uh, in the mm-hmm. way that they were so, so good at winning that ball back up the pitch. Yeah, I mean, that kind of chucker came that's, on. I know, I know that's a lot to, 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 yeah. to digest. No, no. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's really good. Um, I mean, kind of chucker came on right right after the game uh, to speak to um, the 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 Bundesliga.com guys, right? Um, and on, on the world feed, we get that, um, which was great because like the first question I was asked to him was whether he would, he, he said last week that he was unhappy or the way Leverkusen had been defending late as of late. And he said, you know, this time around, he, he was very happy with, with that performance. And I, I think rightfully so, because from a defensive standpoint, I think they did almost everything right. In fact, the goal that was that ended up being the equalizer from Pablo, which um, had an XG of zero point zero three or three percent, right? Very mm. low, uh, very low. And you know, it's uh, in German they call that a Sonntagsschuss, um, a, a lucky Sunday goal. Um, and so, you know, from that point of view, they can be quite happy. I mean, we do also have to remember that Serge Gnabry had that double chance that probably we are all still trying to figure out how. It first hit hit the inside of the post and then stayed out and then he put the rebound on the crossbar. <laughs> um, and so this is actually how Bayern's XG turned out the way it was because it wasn't actually the goal that they scored, which, you know, very low XG. And I do think that is maybe one thing that if I was Bayern Munich was a little bit concerned about is that the fact that they had all this possession and put played by a, by a Leverkusen inside their box. You know, the last 10, 15 minutes felt like a hockey power play, right? <laughs> um, they were just passing the ball around that box and there was bodies flying everywhere and defensive effort. And um, the fact that neither Jamal Musiala and Harry Kane um, and Michael Olyssey as well could, could create something from all that possession and dominance is, I think, something that is very some because... You know, we all were wondering what would happen if they play someone who can actually be better organized than the opposition that they already had. Leverkusen isn't Werder Bremen. They're not Dinamo Zagreb. You know, like the the same style of football isn't going to necessarily work the same way. And so that's maybe something that if I was Bayern Munich was a little would be a little bit concerned about because given the dominance that they had, given the way that they really cornered Leverkusen and had them on the ropes. You got to end them. You know, I, I am a big believer that to win the title, you got to beat your title opponents. Um, a draw isn't enough, right? And I, I, th- I mean, this can also be true for Leverkusen, although they now have the benefit of having the return game in their own stadium, right? And they're essentially in the same scenario now than they were last year. Um, and I think that mm. is that is fascinating. But here's my but. I, I, I would also be concerned if I was Leverkusen because... We, this this wasn't the same as the draw last year. Last yeah. year, mind you, there was less baggage for Leverkusen in the game last year. They weren't champions yet. You know, it was the same. I think it was almost it was the same match day. It was also during Oktoberfest, right? It wasn't. They 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 were no one on no one's mind was what was to come, right? Um, mm-hmm. At that stage, we thought, okay, well, this was Bayern Munich dropped two points, and it's probably going to benefit Dortmund and. Then they went on and actually smashed Dortmund shortly after, right? And I was at that um, Klassica match. And Leverkusen only really started benefiting from the draw a few weeks later on, right? So um, I do think that if I was Leverkusen, I'd be a little concerned about the way Bayern Munich was able to dominate them in so many areas of the pitch. It is all great and good that the defensive effort was there, but I do think too, like Robert Andre's goal, um, what was Leverkusen's XG was below one, right? Um, mm. I don't know if you have the final tally there. 
but it was definitely below one. And the Andrich goal, as great as it was, was similar to the Pavle, which goal a, a, a shot from outside of the box. Mm-hmm. And then there really wasn't much in, in terms of chances created in the second half. I think Bayern Munich completely took Florian Wirtz out of the match, which is extremely difficult to do. You put tongue and sheet into the Substack chat. Did Granit Xhaka touch the ball yet? I think that was 30 minutes in or so. And I mean, he yeah. had 12 times, but you're quite right pointing out that he wasn't able to put the stamp on the game. And if I was Javi Alonso, I'd be very happy about the point, but I would be very concerned about how they got there. Yeah. Um, yeah, Granit Xhaka was very quiet. I actually thought the way that the game was actually cancelled out was that if you actually looked at both sets of central midfielders, Kimmich yeah. and Pavlovich on one side, and then you had uh, Robert Andrik and Granit Xhaka on the other. They were actually both marking each other out of the game. And yeah. I, th- I thought it was quite telling that whenever the ball was in Bayern's half, Andrik was marking Kimmich, as in he was right on top of him. Uh, but equally, when the ball was in Leverkusen's half, uh, Kimmich was marking Andrik to make sure the ball couldn't get passed out to him. So it's almost like that midfield almost cancelled each other mm. out. Um, I do have the XG in front of me. XG uh, Leverkusen's XG for the game was 0.14. Uh, yeah. And Barnes was one point one six, um, and yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the De Classicer actually because I think that's maybe a good way to kind of contextualise this fixture now. If it is going mm-hmm. to be this kind of showdown between these two title contenders, then you know we could certainly look at it and say Leverkusen were very poor, um, and I think I completely agree with you that this performance and this point is only really worth anything if Leverkusen can then go do something at the Bay at the Bay Arena yeah. uh, and and then try and I'll say win that head-to-head, if you will, uh, in a sense, um, against Bayern by taking three points in that game. Um, but, you know, if we if we do kind of go back to the former rivalry that Bayern had against, say, a Dortmund, um, we would have... How many times have we seen Dortmund come to the Allianz Arena? They've been in good form, as people maybe tipping them, and they try to play football, and Bayern Munich just tear them apart. And yeah. we call them naive, and we say, this is classic Bayern, they always do what they do for other fans... Uh, and teams, you know, just completely shrink under the kind of spotlight of the Allianz Arena. Mm. So, in, in a sense, I thought Lever- Leverkusen's performance was certainly not something that would have excited neutral fans or maybe even excited their own fans. And you can certainly, certainly make an argument that maybe they should have been more ambitious to try to go out and win that game. But I thought, in a certain way, they did exactly what they wanted. And I think at the end of the day, you know, Xabi Alonso leaves Munich by a point. And I think you'll probably say, I would have bitten your hand off for that before this game. Um, yeah. And just one other thing I wanted to mention as well, and just talk about defensive performance, because because Opta have tweeted another fascinating stat, which I'm just going to lift right from the Twitter account, uh, <laughs> and it's this. For the first time in three years, Harry Kane failed to attempt a single shot as a starting player in a league match. Uh, and yeah. the last time he failed to do that was in a Tottenham game against Crystal Palace in September 2021. Um, he failed to get a single shot on target. Who scored says Musiala also failed to get a single shot on target. Yeah. And... You know, I don't think that was by accident. I don't think that was by chance. I think it's because Leverkusen did a really, really good job of limiting Bayern's attacking options. Pavlovich obviously stepped up with mm-hmm. an outstanding goal. And as you said, Serge Gnabry probably should have won it for Bayern in the second half. Um, but over and above that, I thought Leverkusen did a good job of limiting Bayern to half chances, which is exactly why they had 18 shots towards goal and were only able to kind of manage to rack up an XG of 1.16. So, but having said all that, um, I, I don't want this to kind of sound like Leverkusen spoiled the party and, and Bayern have to go back and kind of lick the wounds here. I think mm-hmm. I think there's a huge amount that Bayern can take from this performance. You know, and, and like I said, they have looked really impressive in, 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 this, in the start of the season under Vincent Kompany. He's doing things his own ways. We were talking with our subscribers before the game about the fact that yeah. Paulinho has been kind of kept out of this team. So, you know, it's not as if Kompany has come in and he's just taking the advice of the guys above him and just playing and you know, Bayern Munich select 11 and, and just kind of hoping for the best. He has very clear tactical ideas, he has very clear ambitions for his team. He's made a number of players kind of really stand out and perform well. Pavlovich has had a great start this season. Mustial's had a great start. Michael Olesey looks like he's been playing at Bayern Munich for the last five years. Yeah. Serge Gnabry has even done well. Uh, and I would actually even go so far as to say that that backline did more or less okay. Uh, and Luke McCann and Kim. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So... You know, on the whole, I think Bayern Munich have looked a lot better this season than they did, obviously, last season or the season before that, perhaps, as well. So, and 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 I think if there's anything that, Lever- that Bayern can take from this game, and I'm sure fans will be probably kind of cursing uh, the gods right now because they, they would maybe see it as two points dropped against Leverkusen. The other way to look at this, and a positive way to look at this, is it, this is 
is they just played the German champions. They just played one of the most feared teams in European football last season. Uh, and they played them off the park. And that bodes well yep. for a uh, company system, his tactics, it's, it's, it's recognition that they work. Uh, and that should put them in good stead for, you know, the Bundesliga this season, but also the Champions League as well, I think. Yeah, Aston Müller comes next, right? So that's that's going to be, if they play like this, I, I assume they're going to beat Aston Müller. Um, but, I mean, the the one thing, though, that I, I would be a little concerned about is that the way Musiala and Kerry Kane did play in this game. Mm. Um, you know, the... The, the the interesting thing about Musiala is is that the, he's in the middle of these these contract talks now with Bayern Munich, right? And um, those are progressing very well. Um, I think there's the the it's it's something that is going to be uh, ultimately where both sides find an agreement. Uh, Musiala is going to get paid a lot of money and. He's going to be the the centerpiece of this Bayern Munich team for a long time coming when it comes. And then, you know, a big part of the talks hasn't even been about money, I think. Um, Musiala can basically write a blank check at this point and Bayern Munich will just sign it. And it's for the Musiala camp, it's more about wanting to be the face of the team, you know, going forward, wanting to take over Thomas Müller's spot, play the number 10 um, and, you know, be the, the sort of in in a, in a, to use American term, be the face of the franchise, right? Be like the, almost like the quarterback of a football team. You know, this is the first person you see whenever you see anything related to Bayern Munich. And in fairness, they, they have done a lot about that. But I think a big part of of that story also is if you want to be that, and I I hundred percent think he has the pot potential to do it. The, the the face of the team of Bayern Munich for many years, um, for over a decade now, right? has been Thomas Müller. And Thomas Müller stepped up in games like that and provided the game-winning goal, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's still something that we want to just see from Chonjama Musiala um, more often. And I mean, the last time I mentioned this, there, there has been some criticism from Substack subscribers. Again, I want to 100% outline that I'm a huge Jamal Musiala fan and I think he, is, he has the potential to be Germany's best football player. So don't even get me wrong here. I, I do think he, he can get there. But I think that is something that we all want to see, and um, I don't. I think he still sometimes gets frustrated a little bit too much in on big occasions. Uh, I think, you know, we can talk about Felix Zweier and his performance until the cows come home, as you'd like to say, Stefan. <laughs> um, but uh, the truth is, I don't think he the referee was great for either one of those teams, so it can, can, can kind of balance itself out. But, you know, you can't, if you're Musiala, you can't rely on the referee to fix situations for you. You have to be strong on the ball, you have to fight off opponents, and you have to do it in these big games. And, you know, that's, I think, something that still needs to come as a growing moment. And, you know, it, it's, I, I, I mean, we have to say the same about Harry Kane. Harry Kane was invisible in this game. You know, it's all fair and good if he scores three or four goals against the likes of Werder Bremen, but in the end of the day, Bayern Munich signed him to score goals against teams that they're competing for titles for, whether that's Real Madrid in the Champions League or Bayer Leverkusen in the Bundesliga now, right? Mm. And I think that is something that that needs to be happening a bit more. Um, and that's also ultimately, I think, what Bayern Munich didn't win this game. Um, I think that they just weren't clinical enough and they weren't decisive enough in the areas that matter. And so you get these great stats of however much possession it was in the end, but it doesn't help you if you don't if you don't win it in the scoreline. And I think that is something going forward that is probably also going to be a part of these contract negotiations that Bayern Munich say, okay, we'll give you all the money, we'll make you the face of the team, Jamal, but you also have to then deliver, right? And I think that's that's a that's something that going forward, I think all of us want to see a bit more. Yeah. Jamal Siala still plays to me like a player who doesn't understand why big teams uh, target him. He looked, he, he was absolutely yeah. perplexed at the idea of Granit Xhaka pulling his yeah. shirt and shadowing him around the pitch and pushing him over whenever he got, when he could, whenever he could, whenever he could sneak in a push. And you know, he looked like a gentleman playing, you know, uh, 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 a thug's game, you know. And, and yeah. he did understand why uh, Granit Xhaka wasn't playing by the rules. And 
I think this is a kind of rite of passage that a lot of young players with that quality in those positions goes through where they're also used to being these players who can who can pull off the deftest touches, who can play the most dizzying uh, dribbles and score the most remarkable goals. Mm. But yeah. to an extent, they rely on the protection of the officials and the, the referees to do that. But the officials aren't always going to be there to protect you. Of course, technically, they should be. But in big games like this, it's just not going to happen. Um, and if I'm being perfectly honest with you, there was no point in that game where I thought Musiala was, should have been overly aggrieved and not getting a free kick for anything, really. I mean, there was a few kind of kicks and shoves and things, but it was a tight match. It was a very compact box. That's just the way it is. And I think Musiala has to get beyond that and just accept that he's now of a stature that when teams play at Bayern Munich, they're, all, they're always going to have two guys marking him or they're yeah. going to have one guy following around the pitch and they're going to have other guys. I mean, there was there was one free kick where uh, he won on the edge of the box in the, in, in the first half where there are more or less four or five Bayern Leverkusen players lunging at him um, and he was completely perplexed by the whole thing and that that just screams to me a bit of naivety. And I do remember Lino Messi when he was coming through was had some sort of issue as well. And then you realize it clicked in his head that he realized that, well, this is because I'm the best player on the pitch. And you can use that to your advantage because sometimes Messi's best performances were the ones where he dragged players out of position so the likes of Iniesta or David Villa or whoever else could find mm. more space. And I do feel like Musiala has to maybe consider that because at this point in time, and I, and I think this is maybe a criticism that I, I make lightly, but I think it's something that he and Bayern have to bear in mind is that instead of being that kind of selfless player who pulls defenders out of position, Musiala still wants the ball and he still wants to try and beat every man. And that's why he ends up running into these cul-de-sacs. That's why he ends up running into these walls of defenders where he really should be kind of moving out of the way and maybe like a, letting a Sergei Nabi or a Pavlovich or, you know, whoever else yeah. uh, kind of move into that space. Um, and yeah, the exact same thing for Harry Kane. I think Harry Kane probably spent more time on the ground than he did on the ball in this game. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. He he has to kind of prove that he can do this in the big games and not just against the Werder Bremens of this world because Bayern Munich had a striker before him in Robert Lewandowski who did score in the big games, but when it came to, when it really came to the crunch matches in the Champions League, there were question marks as to whether he held the team back. Um, yeah. And those questions will return on force uh, to Harry Kane if he can't really do the same thing in these big games, if he does prove to be a passenger uh, in these big matches. Um it's a one-off game, so you know I don't want to criticize both of them too much, but um, I definitely agree with you. I know to start in this game as well. It's it's definitely a sign uh, that we've criticized both teams. <laughs> it's one of those. It's it's a typical one-one draw, right? But like um, compromise is when both sides are unhappy <laughs> before yeah, that happens exactly. in the end, and um, that's that's I think that's the bottom line here. I, ultimately, you know, I, I think um, both teams will draw a lot of lessons from this. Um, Javi Alonso may be more than Vinny Company, um, but I think for the league overall, this is a really good result because it takes two points off um, both teams, uh, two teams that will, I think, finish the season with a really high point total. And it just uh -huh. keeps everyone kind of together. And that is, I think, for everyone who isn't a Leverkusen and a Bayern fan, that's great to see. So um, I want to just end the, the analysis with a positive thought here.